So, it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Shafi with us today. He comes from uh, Delaware uh, and uh, in principle, I should, uh, I mean, he doesn't need introduction for people who work in the field, but uh, uh, let me anyway to say a few words on his, uh, on his uh, I mean, scientific life. He comes uh, originally from Pakistan and he was, uh, uh, when he was a young guy, a student of Abdul Salam. And uh, he joined then uh, Professor Salam at uh, ICTP. Uh, where uh, he stayed for a long time, as far as I remember, and uh, his uh, field of research is uh, on particle physics, uh, several aspects of particle physics. Mainly, I mean, you all know that the standard model is the way, I, I don't want to take much time, I mean, not, uh, just uh, a few words. We have only 15 minutes. No, no, we have only, <laughs> we have only two minutes. I'm not taking 50 minutes. So the standard model is the way we describe uh, <laughs> particle physics nowadays, fundamental interaction, and Professor Salam works on it, and on physics beyond the standard model. Several aspects of physics beyond the standard model. Something like grand unified theories, supersymmetric theories, higher dimensional theories in general. Okay, so this is his field of expertise, always in connection, or sometimes in connection with. Uh, with cosmology. So the, uh, the, the title of, of the talk uh, is uh, somehow reflects his, uh, his field of research. So it is not uh, only for the lecture of today. And uh, I don't want to steal much more time, just uh, uh, tell you that I have really great pleasure to introduce Professor Shafi, who is the speaker of our forum today. Well, thank you very much. To be here. Of course, I spent many years in ICTP uh, in, uh, in Trieste. You know, Italiano imparato, ma adesso tutto è nel Parlo poco. So I have to speak in English, I'm afraid. Delaware, for some of you who don't know, I don't know, how many of you know where Delaware is? It's only one person. Right? In the States. Well, in the States. <laughs> it's in the States. And actually, it's a state where President Biden comes from. It's, and it's called the first state because it's the state that first signed the Constitution and then it was being written in Philadelphia. So it's right kind of the middle between New York City, some of you must have been there, New York City and Washington, D.C., right in the middle. So there are about a dozen universities. If you start in New York, you come down to Washington, D.C., there are about a dozen universities. We're right in the middle, so we get a lot of speakers from Europe and so on, people who are coming to the East Coast. So that's where President Biden is the senator. And it's a small state, it's called the first state because it's signed. The first it's a small state, it has a lot, lot of beach on the Atlantic Ocean. And when he was a senator for many years, we used to see Biden on our campus because he graduated from this university. And also shopping in supermarkets, you would see him as a senator. Now, of course, he's the president. He doesn't live very far from where he and we see sometimes his military helicopters, sometimes they bring him from D.C. to this house, which is about 15, 10 kilometers from our where we live. So we hope that he will be a president for another term, because otherwise things will get difficult in the U.S. and elsewhere. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be here in your beautiful um, Sicily. I've never been on this um, side of Sicily. I've been in the Erice side, Erice, uh, you know, Palermo side. Where I came as a student once, many years ago, and then I lectured also. And also, we used to have NATO schools in those days, in the 90s. We don't have them anymore. NATO is busy with other things now. But anyway, it's a big, big pleasure to be in your beautiful place. Yeah. So, the title is Elementary Particles in Cosmology. Elementary Particles, as Professor Enzo said uh, a few minutes ago, is the study of the building blocks of the universe tiniest things we can see. And of course, cosmology is on the largest scale. If you ask a cosmologist, what is this planet, they wouldn't know, right? They know only galaxies, which are the building blocks. So largest structures and then the elementary particles, the smallest. But of course, they are well connected because there's this Big Bang cosmology. There was the early universe. The physics of the early universe is intimately related to elementary particles. You have to know the forces in nature uh, to understand uh, 
the early universe and then to understand the subsequent evolution of the universe. So this Enzo pointed out, asked me to make it accessible to uh, also to undergraduates. So if there are some undergrad, there are a few undergraduates here, a lot of young people here, so it's nice to see you there. So if you have any questions, just ask me. Uh, but hopefully it's not entirely trivial, the talk today, but please do, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, let me see. This one moves it forward. This one, maybe this is the pointer. This, and this, up and this, up. this yes. I should point it somewhere. No, no, no the bottom one. The bottom one? Yes. Ah, yes. Ah, ah, this one, goes, I'm holding it the other way. Huh? Okay, this one is the one. So units, quickly, I think uh, it's not so critical today, but basically we, of, sometimes if I say some things, it will be in GV, like the Hubble constant people say is 60 or 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. In these units, it's like 10 to the minus 42 GV or something. So it may be useful just uh, the physics that we'll be talking about, uh, this is the Planck time, sometimes we call it, ten, we will be at times much later than that, some orders of magnitude below that. In other words, you know, nuclear synthesis happened and the universe was a minute old. So this is much earlier, we won't do deal with this, but several orders below that. The standard model, let's say, operates at 10 to the minus 10 seconds on this scale. Newton's constant is, un is written like this, in GV to the minus 2 and so on. Not so important. So uh, the, the idea is that uh, elementary particles now uses this idea for about 100 years or perhaps even longer, goes back really to Maxwell and perhaps even before that to Galileo and others. Basically the idea of un unifying unity in physics, some kind of unity. And some of the most important one is this one, where you know Maxwell unified electricity and magnetism, which had evolved for many years. And then basically by unifying and somewhat modifying some of the equations, he, he wrote down Maxwell's equations. One of the, then the electromagnetic field came out of it, F mu nu we call it, is the electric field and the magnetic field. And then of course he predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. And, and, and then it was realized by Lorentz and others that these things obeyed some rules of transformations which were different from the rules of, of Galilean relativity that Newton's laws obeyed. So this was the appearance of what's called Lorentz invariance. The equations were invariant under Lorentz in symmetry, which means unification of space and time. And then basically starting with Einstein and special relativity, the, he declared basically that laws of physics, if we ignore gravity, then the laws of physics really should follow uh, you know, special relativity, etc. Where space-time is still rigid in this framework. Space-time is rigid, all laws happen, particles move and interact, and all this is very successful, of course. It's a very successful operation, yeah. And of course, uh, this, uh, this four-dimensional unification of space-time then led to special uh, relativity of Einstein. And then once you combine special relativity with quantum mechanics, the other great discovery of 20th century physics, then of course, the one of the great predictions that came out was the existence of antiparticles. Dirac found that. And then eventually people realized that you should really uh, take these, this, this relativistic quantum mechanics is not good enough. You should quantize it again, quantize what we used to call wave functions really. And what is important really are the fields that every particle, elementary particle we talk about is associated with the quantum field essentially, electron, photon, graviton, and so on. And that's uh, quantum field theory, very successful, right? Quantum electrodynamics developed soon after the Second World War. And, you know, it's a theory which is very, very successful. And in the meantime, of course, people, Einstein had developed general relativity, which is a theory of gravitation, a big leap from Newton's theory, but in any way, important theory uh, of general relativity, where the Instead of Newtonian potentials only, we talk about um, uh, tensor field, it's a, a Riemannian geometry. And that combined with standard model, again unifying, looking for unification, that if you combine these two, we get into what's called hot Big Bang cosmology. So that's already we know. And you know, Einstein already by writing down general relativity predicted gravitational waves, whereas Hertz discovered electromagnetic waves just soon after they were predicted, it took about more than 100 years 
to find gravitation waves. But this is a very exciting subject, especially for young people now. The discovery of gravitational waves has spurred a great amount of interest, and I'll say a few words about it uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, so, four fundamental forces in nature, you recognize at the moment, there are four fundamental forces, and in some units, let's say if the strong force is of strength unity, measured in some dimensionless units, then the electro electromagnetic force is about 1% of that, 110 to the minus 2. Weak force is 10 to the minus 5. This started, the theory of the weak force was written down after Pauli, after Pauli introduced the neutrino, was first written down by Fermi, actually. Very successful theory. But it took another few decades before people wrote down the standard model and the Fermi theory became really a theory where you can calculate even more precisely. So the standard model of high energy physics is really these three forces, has a very, very successful theory. Somewhat too successful, right? People have been trying for decades to sort of, you know, move it forward. We know that it's not complete. We know we have good reasons, experimental, observational reasons, to know that this theory is not complete. And then there's, of course, gravity. If you try to, so this theory is unified. These are unified forces in some sense. If you, if, you, if you try to put these four together, this one with these three, then you run into problems. It's not a very productive thing, really. Uh, so there's still a theory of quantum gravity. People think, uh, used to think, certainly, and still think that maybe string theory in higher dimensions is, a, is, a, is the right way to go. But I won't have much to say about it today uh, on string theory. So the standard model, just to remind ourselves, is a theory based on what's called the gauge principle. In other words, electric charge is conserved, right? We all believe that. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from a gauge principle, a symmetry under phase rotation. Phase being just, you know, if you have an x, y, and z, and you rotate it in the x, y plane, that's a rotation on a circle, let's say. It's just this kind of a phase. If you take the electron field and let it, it's a complex field, and make a phase rotation and demand that the quantum mechanics is invariant under these local phase rotations, which where each phase depends on space and time. Basically, you get a local theory, and from there, following Noether, uh, Emily Noether, who showed that if you have an invariance of a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian, then there should be a conservation law. Most of you have studied that, right? Even undergraduate, that if you have an invariance uh, of some under some transformation, there should be a conserved quantity. And that's how we understand conservation of electric charge. And that is a very successful theory. That's the basis of electromagnetism. Very successful. So classical electrodynamics, we quantize and there's a gauge symmetry, and then you can build all of electrodynamics. Well, this is the standard model basically is a generalization of that, except that the symmetry now is not just U1. So in other words, this, this part here is called the electroweak theory. Actually, this is electroweak theory. So weak interactions of Fermi that Fermi wrote down is contained inside here, and also electromagnetism of Maxwell is contained. So notice this is not U1 electromagnetism. It comes out of this theory. So this, in some sense, is even more fundamental because because this the Fermi theory required charged bosons to mediate interactions, and the photon is massless, right? So it is not just massless, but has no electric charge. So all this electric charge is embedded inside this thing, is it? Uh, and, and this theory is also very special. It's a theory of the strong force. The, 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 uh, you know, when nuclear physicists talk about protons and neutrons, they are elementary particles. So inside the sun, the, the nuclear physicists can calculate the physics and explain to you this energy, the interactions, and so on. But of course, we now know that if if you take two protons at the CERN collider in Geneva and collide them at energies on the order of 10,000 uh, GeV, then those, if you give it to the nuclear physicists, they would probably say, look, this is not our subject, right? Because the protons collide and quarks and gluons mix and then, you know, it's out of their reach. It's about 10 million times higher than the energy at the center of the sun. And that's strong interactions. Quarks and gluons are the ones which are important at this stage. And so this one typically is what we say is the standard model as we understand it today. This captures the building blocks, if you like. 
So in the early universe, if you want to do cosmology, then these are the particles that are playing a role, right? These are the particles and these are the forces in Big Bang cosmology. Certainly when the universe is about 10 to the minus 10 seconds old, these are the particles, which, and above that, these are the particles that are in, in interacting and interacting with each other. These are the meta particles, we call them meta fields. So you and I and all the galaxies we observe that shine are made basically of these guys only. And, and then of course this part here, right? You and, you and I are made of protons and neutrons essentially, and the observable universe that shines. But that's only a fraction of the energy density in the universe. This second family also exists, which is charm, these quarks also, and then followed by its own muons and neutrino. And then, then, then there's a third family, which is where this guy is much heavier than this one. This one actually is about, it's a, these are elementary particles, right? So <clears throat> these are not made out of anything. This is 175 times heavier than a proton, but it's elementary. And, and actually, one thing to notice is that this charm, this is a charged two-third object. Up, we, we usually call up and down particles, up and down, up and down, except that we have to give them different names because we use this up and down for these guys. And the, the charm, the up-type guy is always heavier than the down. They are also the up-type guy is much heavier than the bottom. Actually, this is 175, this is about 5 GB, let's say. Right? As it turns out, luckily for us, this up type guy is lighter than this, which makes the neutron heavier than the proton. If, and if the up had been heavier, you and I wouldn't be around because the neutron would be lighter and then, you know, we wouldn't have atoms and so on. So that's another mystery in physics theory. Why, why is it that these guys are, the up type guy is much heavier than this one? This is about 10 times heavier here. This is about 30 times or something heavier or 40 times heavier. Why? Whereas this guy is just slightly lighter. Now these guys are, each, each of these families, this is this one, it's a one family, electron, neutrino. Notice there are three types of up, so it's like ice cream that we see in, near the Duomo, right? Eat, these are flavors of quarks, and then they come in three colors, actually, which is just a degree of freedom, quantum degree of freedom. So if they carry a color degree of freedom, this is color degree, then they interact with gluons, which are the analogs of the photon, the particle of light, except that the gluons themselves carry color. The photon doesn't carry electric charge, but it couples to electrically charged particles. But the gluon interacts through with these quarks, and that's what makes the strong force. But itself, it can, because it carries color, it interacts also with itself. That. This guy is a famous Higgs boson, sometimes I think called the God particle. They basically, it's the guy which gives masses to all these all these meta fields essentially. This chap gives masses to all these guys, plus plus the Z boson and the W boson. So these are the bosons that mediate weak forces that Fermi was thinking about, right? Muon, new proton, neutron decay, muon decay, and so on. We, we people needed W boson. It's a charge boson. So therefore, because electrically charged, it interacts with the photon. The Z boson is somehow the, 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 the brother, the heavy partner of the photon, essentially. Because the photon disappeared, it's SU2 plus U1. When you diagonalize the matrix, you get two eigenstates, mass eigenstates, Z and W, and they were found at CERN in the 80s. The photon, of course, is uh, the one predicted by Maxwell, but it's a particle now, you know that. And these gluons also carry color. This guy is a spin zero. So it's the only spin zero object we know in nature that is elementary. I mean, CERN has found dozens of them. For decades, we know spin zero boson, like pi meson is spin zero, but they all composite. But this chap here is elementary as far as we know. So this took about 45, 50 years almost to find this. It was predicted in the mid 60s by Higgs then Weinberg, Salam, and so on, constructed this theory, exploiting this mechanism. And this, by exploiting, they predicted the existence of this particle, plus massive guys. All these were found. The, these have been found. Everything is, actually, everything has been found on this table. That's right. So everything is known. And one of the feature of strong interactions is that anything that carries color is confined. So protons and neutrons really are neutral atoms. 
they are color neutral atoms just as a hydrogen atom has a positive charge and an electron around it, but you can ionize it. You cannot ionize a proton or a neutron. You cannot do that. It, it, it doesn't work like that. Because that would mean uh, separating this, knocking this guy out. And people did try over decades knocking these quarks out of protons and so on, and neutrons. But finally, it was accepted that uh, these things are confined. In other words, anything that carries charge, you cannot isolate it. It exists only in a configuration of neutral, color neutral particles. And because of the group theory of SU3, uh, basically you can take these three guys and it make a singlet out of it. It's like, you know, usually plus and minus makes a zero charge. When you have uh, some non abelian theories like SU3, you can take three of these guys and make a neutral particle. So this object is, so when protons collide at CERN, it's not that simple, of course. It's, pro, it's these valence quarks are there, but of course there's a, all the gluons and so on, all kinds of stuff in there when they collide. And indeed, that's the way we make the Higgs boson. When we take collide protons, this is a it's a cartoon definition of a core. We think that they are tied together by string. So if you if you try to explore the proton, excuse me, if you try to explore the proton, uh, in, in, you know, at, at short distances, it looks like these guys are there loosely bound together like a Coulomb force. But the moment you try to knock them out, then the strong force builds up, and, and then you can't do that. So color neutral atoms exist in nature, and so color is confined, means you can't isolate color, and, but at short distances, is, and that is very successful. That deserved a Nobel Prize, and they got it, right? It was discovered, this property was discovered some time ago, uh, I guess in the 1970s, and then verified over many decades before the Nobel Prize were given for this calculation. Shall I try to put it here? Since I'm standing, just leave it like that, maybe. So the Higgs boson took some time, and because, basically because E equals mc squared, so the point was E equals mc squared, so you put enough energy, you can make a, convert it into mass, but the point is also it depends on how it interacts. And it doesn't interact through with, with electrons and up quarks and so on. It doesn't interact very strongly. So you have to do it in a more tricky way. Uh, but over the last 10 or 15 years, people have shown that the Higgs boson, in 2012, they officially declared at CERN that they have found the Higgs boson. And essentially, it is a little bit, this, this is, we say that this theory is spontaneously broken, a little bit like condensed matter physics, where you have you know, the phenomena of spontaneous magnetization, ferromagnetism, or, or superfluids or superconductors. As a superconductor, basically, you have a state where the electrons combine and make a spin zero state, and that condenses and makes, basically, electromagnetism is broken. U1 is broken, right? And here, also, there's a symmetry breaking. So it's like any other symmetry. If you go to higher temperatures, symmetry gets restored, like a ferromagnet. If you warm it up, heat it up, above a critical temperature, the spins point in different directions. They are not polarized and you break the spin symmetry spontaneously. Like on a round table, if the, you know, the cutlery is laid out on the left and right, if you think it's left, right symmetric, but you pick up, let's say, the right one, then it's, the symmetry is broken. This is a little more tricky than that, but that's the idea. That you break, this was the Nobel Prize winning discovery also. That you take a symmetry, break it with the Higgs boson, condensate, Instead of Cooper pairs, you have to put elementary fields in and then you get electromagnetism. And you don't break this also because we know the photon is massless. So this means that three, four, four vector boson particles that mediate the forces have three of them acquire a mass, only the fourth one remains massless. And this has a con this is a temperature, this this object has a that has a value of about 100 GV. So this this in well, where we are standing now, the ground state here, actually, since we are below the critical temperature, we are living in a Higgs space. That's why the W boson and the Z bosons would travel, have a mass. But a photon, as it travels here, is massless. Neutrinos, it turns out, have a mass too. But uh, it's a, that's a different story. And the mass of this guy, this was the reason why they couldn't find it. It has a mass of about 125 GeV. Now, this theory doesn't predict the mass, but we... People kept looking, didn't give up, and eventually this was found. 
to have a mass of about, it's elementary, and it's a little bit like a superconductor, actually. So, of course, so the, the standard model is successful, right? It's a theory of strong, weak electromagnetic interactions, amazingly successful, but not 100% so. And here's some reason that neutrinos in the standard model that I wrote down, there were electrons in the neutrino. Well, if you do, the electrons in the neutrino get a mass through the Higgs mechanism. So all the charged fermions in the theory and the gauge bosons get a mass by coupling to the Higgs. But if you look at the way the model is constructed, it, it doesn't give any mass to the right-handed neutrino, so they remain massless. So that's a prediction of the standard model. In, at least in perturbation theory, to all orders in perturbation theory, they are massless. Well, we know after a lot of effort uh, over decades that we now know that neutrinos actually are not massless. The neutrinos coming from the sun are first produced as electron neutrino, but eventually oscillate and some fraction get converted to muon neutrino and tau. In quantum mechanics, we can have such phase transitions. You could have a weak, weak a phase of the neutrino produced as an electron neutrino, but as it propagates, it's actually a linear combination of mass eigenstates. You remember, you can diagonalize the mass matrices from flavor basis to mass basis. So, and, and so in, in that, the masses are tiny, by the way, but they are non, they are non-zero. And you need these masses to explain neutrino oscillations. Massless neutrinos don't oscillate. And so this means that there is, there is new physics of some kind. Actually, and also we now know, for instance, to make structure, large-scale structure in the universe, given our present <coughs> theories of structure formation, you need some dark matter. To I will say a few words why we need dark matter to produce uh, to produce structure. Plus, there are many other observations: rotation curves of stars and galaxies, and so on. The standard model also doesn't explain why electric charge is quantized. No one has ever seen a, a particle with a charge of 1.1 times the electron charge, right, or pi times. In principle, in the standard model, you can write down particles with any charge you like, square root of pi times z. Theory will remain consistent, provided you do it properly, but electric charge is quantized in nature, and how do we understand that? This is a theoretical question, right? These are practical questions, because we know we need these parts, something like a dark matter particle. And we don't understand why you and I exist, and the galaxies exist. Because according to Dirac and relativity and, co and quantum mechanics, there are particles and antiparticles. Whereas if there's an anti me, there should be if there's me, there should be an anti me. But we know that all galaxies we observe are matter. So somehow some asymmetry was produced in the early universe. For decades we, we assume that we know the number. Uh, it's, it's a tiny amount. The question is what's the origin? We would like to understand this thing. The standard model, it turns out, has some of the ingredients to explain it, but not quantitatively. So it cannot explain this number. It would be good to have it. Stability, I think Enzo and many other people have worked on stability of the electroweak vacuum. The electroweak vacuum actually turns out is, is at best metastable. And we want to know, most likely, it depends on the top quark mass, but that's what the understanding is. Anyway, there are other problems. Dark energy is a problem for any, everybody, not just a standard model, which is actually the dominant component of the energy density today, uh, not in the early universe when structure was formed. Neutrino oscillations, I think I don't have to do that, but this, this basically summarizes uh, uh, what the neutrinos are. They are this, this one is a mixture of different flavors, you know, different flavors of neutrinos. And people are work on, you know, you can develop, you work on theory, theory, trying to understand this thing. And hot Big Bang cosmology now, as I stated earlier, comes from combining the standard model with, with, with Einstein's general relativity. And basically, you assume also that on sufficiently large scales, when you write down the theory, we assume that on sufficiently large scale, the universe is both isotropic and homogeneous. So isotropic means we are not preferred observers on sufficiently large scales. As we look around in the, in the CM, cosmic microwave background sky, it appears to be isotropic. I can measure the CMB in any direction, and it looks the same, measures the same in all directions. 
And so there are three remarkable predictions. Expanded, the universe is expanding, there's CMB exists, and there's nuclear synthesis which happens. There won't be any time to talk about it. But basically, the physics of this is nuclear physics. It happens in the first three minutes. There's a very nice book um, written a long time ago by Weinberg called The First Three Minutes. And, but with the standard model, we can go before the first three minutes. He starts around the second and then takes the story from there and sees how the light elements evolve. But you can, but the standard model allows us to go back to at least 10 to the minus 10 seconds, if not even earlier. So this is one of the big discoveries of the 20th century. Hubble basically finds just as showing this law that, you know, if you look at galaxies, uh, uh, on large scales, you basically see that they are receding from us and the speed is proportional to the distance. And today the value of the, this is an important quantity for decades. People were arguing about the number between 50 and 100. Finally, it's settled here. And even today, it's not entirely settled to within a few percentage. Uh, but this is an important quantity. You can, you can actually, uh, a naive way to describe it is to take these, each galaxy, let's say these are different galaxies, a distance r from us, 2r, and so on. And these are, and these coordinates move, uh, these are co-moving coordinates, but the physical distance is basically related to, uh, is proportional to r, and this scale factor a then basically tells you what the rate of change is, and if you just work it out, you can see this kind of a law. This is a very naive way to see it. But basically, this we know that on large scales, distance galaxies, there may be some local movement, but essentially there is a recession velocity in galaxies. For most of its history, actually, the universe was expanding but decelerating during radiation domination, matter domination. It's only in the recent history that dark energy dominates and the universe seems to be accelerating. This is a plot. I think I asked my student, he, I haven't looked at it myself carefully, but he sent me this slide just very recently showing that these, there's, there's some uh, discrepancy still. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's people write papers about it, explaining why the CMB numbers are here and the, some of the other numbers are a little bit far, further away. It, it will be resolved at some point, I suppose. And this is summary. This, you see this slide all the time. There's a big bang of some kind. We don't know what it is. Actually, it doesn't have to be a hot universe. It's perfectly plausible to take, start with a perfectly cold universe. All we need is a scalar field rolling down a potential. And as it rolls down a potential, it could be the standard model Higgs field. Imagine, because you see the standard model Higgs field is a potential, is a Mexican head potential. And today it sits in the minimum and W's and Z's have a mass. And the photon is mass, it sits here. But imagine in the early universe it was up there somewhere, just the Higgs field, nothing else, with a certain potential energy density. Right, of the Mexican hat, someone put it there in the universe and it starts rolling, the universe expands exponentially. You don't need a hot universe. Then it comes down as it, it's like a pendulum, right? So now the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. This field oscillates. We know the Higgs field couples to quarks and leptons and W bosons. So it will couple and create these particles, right? It gives masses to these particles. There's enough energy in the system. If you start with a high it can produce anything you like. And that's actually is a perfectly viable scenario today. You can start with a cold universe, doesn't need this big bang word. The big bang is just convenience. You start with a cold universe, eventually you do what's called, when the field rolls down, it's called inflation, by the way. That's an important concept. And that is important because it helps it explain why the CMB we observe today is so isotropic. And the reason is, in ordinary Big Bang cosmology, if you didn't have this phase, this inflationary phase, where the field rolled down and the universe expanded exponentially, if you don't have that, then you have a hard time explaining. All you can say is if everything was, you know, according to radiation dominated, photons or radiation dominates, and the universe expands, you, as you go back in time, you find that the whole sky could not have been in causal contact. Just only about two degrees in the sky, let's say. And you need inflation to, 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 to explain that. Sorry, that back. So, but in any case, this summarizes inflation, then you produce a standard model. And there, there could be also dark matter here. 
then you continue, and at some point, you, uh, this is time here, and this is the time of the standard model, by the way. This is, this is time we can still work with. It's, a, it's the time for grand unified theories. I'll mention that shortly. These are theories which unify the standard model forces. Remember there's SU3, SU2, U1, so there are three forces in the standard model. It's partially unified. Weak and, weak and electromagnetic interactions are unified, but strong interactions are not. And grand unified theories actually operate around this thing. But this is a safe time to work with because gravity is here and there is some distance. So we don't, the gravitational force actually is not so, at, at, at these times, you can't distinguish the gravitational force from the other forces. In the dimensionless units I mentioned, I forgot, probably I showed it, in units where the strong force is of order one, the gravitational force is 10 to the minus 38. But when we are at this time, it's uh, very comparable. So, so this is, but this is safe. This is the standard model. By the way, this is pretty confident, right? The standard model. Now, maybe some new things that we haven't seen yet, but this physics we think are pretty good, all understood, understood rather well. You make, you know, at some point you start making, at when you cool down enough, the quark gluon plasma starts to confine. The strong force becomes active, the protons and neutrons are formed, and then when they, at some point, sorry about that, at some point, uh, at some point, uh, uh, you atoms, later on some atoms can also form and so on, and then it comes, you know, then particle physicists cannot do much. Actually, after this time, this is the end of particle physics, and you have to hand it over to nuclear physicists and atomic physicists and people who work with structure formation, how to proceed from there. So, what do I have here? This is the CMB measurement. I think, again, my student Amit did that. He tried to show here that this is the Planck measurement of the CMB sky. You know, hot and dark spots, there are fluctuations. The microwave background is highly isotropic, but not entirely so. We don't expect it to be perfectly isotropic because we know there's structure in the universe. So something must have created some perturbations and therefore there must have been some fluctuations in the temperature. And Kobe satellite was the first one, probably before several of you were born in the 1990s, early 1990s. Kobe for the first time detected delta T over T on the order of 10 to the minus five or so. Now we know it to a much better accuracy thanks to WMAP the Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probe and then the Planck satellite, which finished last, uh, completed its analysis, the final analysis in 2018, 2019, let's say. So this, this tells us that CMB is isotropic, but not entirely so. And this is a current Planck map, I think. It, it finds all these things. This, this is related to physics in the early universe, which is known for some time, independent of inflation. This is not inflation. But, but the point is inflation not only makes the universe isotropic, the CMB, but also provides a source of where fluctuations came from. You want to make the universe isotropic, but still provide some fluctuations. It turns out today we think that's due to quantum fluctuations. The field I was mentioning that rolls down and the potential energy dominates when the potential in Einstein's equation, when that dominates, then the universe expands exponentially. And so this, this let, let me say through this slide. Today we think that this is a very good model of large-scale structure. We call it the lambda CDM model. Lambda for dark energy, which which is, makes up about 70% of the universe's energy density, and CDM for cold dark matter. And this is makes up about 25, 24, 25% of the energy density in the universe. Notice that the standard model is here. We have spent 150 years understanding just this part here, right? right? Just the standard model, because quarks and protons and neutrons. And only about one, some fraction of this 4.6% shines actually, right? There's dark matter, Jupiter, dark stars and all that anyway. Uh, and this we know from uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis how much of it is uh, shines and what doesn't shine. We know that this much, this much dark baryons are present, this much. So this is really the standard model of high energy physics. 
then you could say, will it take two, three hundred years to understand dark matter? After all, it makes up 25. And the answer is, we don't think so. An elementary, a good elementary particle could explain that, could be produced in the early universe. So we think, and there's a lot of activity that maybe all it needs is to supplement the standard model with some new clever dark matter which can be found. And of course, the xenon experiment in Rome, in Gran Sasso, and many other experiments also in the US and elsewhere are looking for this dark matter particle through, through various experiments. So, so, uh, so of course, some people think, a fraction minor minority think, that maybe that we should modify Einstein or Newton's laws and so on. But, but the easiest thing is to have a dark matter particle, and then this part of the universe will be, uh, will be understood, actually. This, this picture is not the same uh, in the early universe. It changes because radiation scales as 1 over a to the power 4, where a is the scale factor faster than matter, 1 over a cubed. And, then, and if it's dark energy, it can be just steady, constant. So this is why we can, we can have these various histories of the universe. This is, uh, this, I don't know whether I should go into the details, but basically this is the metric we use. You remember if, if k is zero, then this basically looks like a, a four-dimensional metric, except time is in special relativity, and this thing is a scale factor, tells you how the universe is expanding. And uh, depending on this k, we now know, for instance, nature is very kind to us, actually. Through measurements now, we know that k is zero. So in other words, our universe, it appears, is spatially flat. It's not curved in, like, a, like a sphere, a three-dimensional sphere, or, or like a saddle or something. Uh, this, is, this is what I meant. The universe today looks uh, more like this thing, three-dimensional analog of that rather than a curved surface. And depending on uh, how the unit for a flat universe, it's very easy to see that matter scales as a to the minus three, and, and so the scale factor grows, radiation. So the scale factor is always growing, but during that period when the energy density, potential energy dominates rather than radiation or matter, then if in that case, uh, a is exponential. So you see, we need primordial inflation to explain why the universe is so isotropic. We, we, we think that's what happened to explain it. But as it turns out, today there is, the universe is expanding like that. It is dark energy. It's expanding exponentially because the universe is accelerating for the first time again. So primordial inflation, the universe accelerated, then it expanded, but with the power law, and then and now again it expands exponentially. So I think it's a good hint from the universe that, look, it's okay to accelerate. And you need that acceleration to, to sort of explain why the universe is spatially flat. And it happens because you take a small sphere, uh, even if it's curved, if you make it very big and expand it sufficiently, it will become flatter and flatter, right? So that's the, it's not, not anything magical. And this, this is an example of the horizon problem. Why in the standard Big Bang cosmology, we cannot understand why the microwave background is. So we are here observing the sky. The Big Bang was here. And you see this region of the sky and this region of the sky show the same temperature, the CMB here, right? This is the CMB. But the point is, if I go back, these things were not in causal contact with each other. And that's the challenge. In, in inflation, basically, these guys get into contact because the picture changes in this region here. So that's how we explain uh, why the really, because we need to make sure that this whole region is, is, is isotropic. What you find if you do the naive calculations, only about two degrees or so, not, not this whole sky. Of course, this fluctuation 10 to the minus 5 is also from inflation. As the field rolls, there are quantum fluctuations, and basically they translate into energy density fluctuations and temperature fluctuations. And we think that those are the primordial fluctuations that eventually start growing once radiation becomes subdominant and matter starts dominating. I think I should watch out for time, by the way. So that's how inflation sorts it out. This is a little bit technical picture, but basically explaining how, how you go, you leave the 
in, in, there's a constant energy density means the Hubble is a constant Hubble length, and then these scales accelerate out, and then eventually end, re-enter the horizon again, and, and then they have already been in causal contact here. Dark matter, we know one of the reasons we you've probably seen it many times in talks that rotation curves of galaxies suggest if you had only Newton's law and no dark matter in the halo, the, the galaxy, the rotation curves would follow this kind of a pattern. But what you observe is this. This is one motivation for dark matter, observational evidence that you need dark matter. And and dark matter, so if it's primordial dark matter, you should be able it's passing through. Yeah, contact uh, this city here, or it's passing through Syracuse or everywhere, right? So basically, if in collider physics at CERN, we can produce dark matter because E equals mc squared. We don't know what, if you tell us what the mass is and what the properties is, we can look and that's what people do. We, we serve, some of us make a living suggesting to theorists, to experimentalists, that look, this is a plausible dark matter candidate, and people put limits on those things, right? They do experiments. And so there, what you do is you have known particles colliding, and then you make dark matter, somehow produce dark matter. But of course, there's also the early universe was a great ex collider and made dark matter. In that case, you can look for dark matter, and this is direct detection, where the, where the dark matter interacts with the standard model particle. The dark matter, the dark matter particle comes in, interacts with the standard model particle in wherever you are, like in xenon, experiment in Gran Sasso, and then it deflects, and then we try to detect this interaction. And they're, they're putting fairly serious limits have been put in, and this is a, this is a, this is xenon, I think one of the xenon, this is the xenon experiment probably, I think one ton. Now they have got, this is and probably a little older curve, but this is 2018, so it's not the most recent curve, but this tells you the cross-section of the standard, of the of the, the dark matter interacts with the nucleus versus the mass of the particle. These are typically called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. And these are these are masses that people have focused on for a long time. But now people are going all the way this way to very light particles, which could be dark matter. People go several orders of magnitude in this direction, ultralight dark matter and so on. And new work is being done uh, to look for those particles as dark matter. And of course, this is when you can produce dark matter yourself, right, at the collider. And this, of course, is also a very active field, making dark matter. And so a few words now. I have, how much time do I have left? 10, 10 15. Okay. So, so, now, so now the question is, what about theories? Can we say something about dark matter? So let me say a few words. The standard model is successful, doesn't have a good non-baryonic dark matter candidate. It could happen that if you have standard model and inflation, you could, from quantum fluctuations, you could make black holes. And this is an area of active study. And that could be dark matter. But I'm assuming that standard model doesn't have an elementary dark matter particle, not a black hole, let's say. And how do we make it? And that's one motivation. Standard model has no dark matter particle. Also, the quarks and leptons, you remember I said these are quark multiplets and these are uh, lepton multiples. They were separate. Can we unify that? After all, we are trying to unify forces. How about putting them all together rather than having three forces and so on? And that's the idea behind unified theories. There's nothing grand about it. I mean, it's not that these theories solve many problems, but they do extend the standard model. And of course, if we want to, if possible, elect, why electric charge is quantized? Because if you, uh, because Dirac pointed out in more, about 90 years ago that if you have magnetic monopoles, then, then this, we can explain why electric charge is conserved. And there are many other reasons. So at least let's learn one thing. How can we, this is supersymmetry. If you have a new symmetry at the TV region, one of the most popular theories we had in the, from the 80s till now, Currently, it's cooled down a bit because no one has seen supersymmetry. CERN hasn't seen the collider. But basically, if we take the presently measured fine structure constants of the standard model, remember I said the strength is 10 to the minus 2, 1, and so on. Well, there are fine structure constants like the electromagnetic structure, 1 over 137. 
And these fine structure constants, if you evolve them, with, they are not really constants. They are couplings which vary according to the field theory with energy scale. Depends at what scale you're probing the interaction. And, and this tells us, this is a logarithmic scale, and it tells us how the the U1 coupling and the SU2 coupling and the SU3, the inverse couplings are varying. And if you put in supersymmetry in the TeV region, 1,000 to 10,000 GeV, they really tend to come together at one point. That's like symmetry breaking. In other words, if you go to very high energies, well beyond the reach of today's accelerators, but certainly within reach of the early universe, then at, at that scale, you had this theory. And maybe we can study the implications of that theory. And this is what I will see, show in a couple of slides. Because CERN cannot reach these energies. So to, you can't probe it directly. But maybe there are some other consequences we can follow uh, by, by, by looking at this, this kind of a theory. What is this theory, which only seems to have one coupling, one parameter, this coupling constant? They all seem to merge. So that's, that's called a unified theory, actually. And in, in these supersymmetric theories, there are many dark matter candidates. We often call them neutralinos. They are wimps, and they, are, they go by the name of Dino, Dino. Basically, what Susie says is for every elementary particle in nature, there is a, a, an object which differs from it by spin a half. Now, people say this is a very complicated theory. Actually, it's the same theory, ordinary theory, standard model, except that instead of a quantum field, you call it a quantum superfield. So a superfield naturally comes with two components. So that's a tricky way to say things, simple things. So it's not really a complicated theory. It's a very elegant theory, actually. It solves many of the problems of the standard model. It unifies the couplings. It provides a dark matter candidate. The only problem is we haven't seen it in nature so far. So, but the NHC run three has started and they are really looking for it. If I told, I was at a meeting last, two months ago, the experimentalists were there from CERN, from the Atlas, the big experimental group, Atlas, CMS, Alice, and NHCB, and they're all still, at least subgroups of those people are still working and also looking for other things, of course. So, these are some of the limits. In other words, what do I mean that CERN hasn't seen supersymmetry at some of the gluinos, which is CERN is a gluino factory, which is the analog of gluon. Gluon is a gluino partner. CERN hasn't seen anything like a gluino with masses about 2000 G. Is that discouraging? A little bit, yes. But we don't know how supersymmetry. Supersymmetry predicts that if it's the standard model is exactly supersymmetric, then so, uh, the supersymmetric partners have the same mass as the ordinary particles we have observed. Clearly, it's broken, and no one knows for sure how to break it, and therefore, we don't know where the spectrum starts. Hopefully, if you're optimistic, supersymmetry will be found, and look how much stuff they can look for if it's found. But one of the great predictions of the standard model is that proton is, un is not stable. Why is that? Because in the standard model, proton is essentially stable. Look. Photon can decay into a positron plus a pi meson. Nothing stops you. But there's no... So, electric charge is sacrosanct. Why? Because it comes from gauge invariance, right? I said that's the, anything which follows from gauge invariance, conservation law, has to be respected. We think also by gravity. But, but why is the proton not decaying? After all, it has a charge one. Why can't it decay into a positron plus a pi meson? Simple. Right? This is a proton decaying into a positron, and this is a pi meson. This is a pi meson. So what was wrong with that? Well, in the standard model, it's very clever. Standard model doesn't have this process. doesn't let you do this. But in principle, it's possible. And indeed, that's exactly what happens when you unify the forces. You put quarks and leptons together, rather than the standard model. Everything is together. So now there are gauge bosons which, meet in, which, which come in and can convert let's say, two up quarks into a positron and a down quark, which then can combine with this guy and make a meson. This is one of the big predictions. So even though I showed you earlier that the unification happens at energies several orders beyond the CERN scale, which is only 10 to the 4 GeV, and this was 10 to the 16, 10, 12 orders of magnitude dip, you can still find ways to test the theory in the lab. And the only problem is that the lifetime limits now are 10 to the 34 years. So in other words, our universe is what? 13.7 billion years old, right? But 
that we know that the proton is lives for at least 10 to the 34 years. So therefore you have to build a big detector to look for that and in there, indeed the next generation will be the hypercoming Kanade in Japan. So this will be tested uh, in Japan, uh, this proton decay process. Uh, but let me say a word about quantization, why I think grand unified theories are so elegant. Really. They, in grand unified theories you use a group which is compact mathematically and therefore electric charge is, is not like, a, you know, in the standard model you have SU2 cross U1 and U1 is like a circle but really, strictly speaking, it's not a circle, it's like a real line. So it's non-compact. A circle is compact. So, but in the grand unified theory, this U1 gets embedded inside a compact group like SU, as you know, orthogonal group rotations is compact. SO3, three-dimensional rotation is compact. Right, where we use Euler angles or something to describe rotation, right? So SU2 is really the Pauli matrices, comes from Pauli, right? This theory of angular momentum is a compact sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, right? That's compact. So can, so the, what the grand unified theory does is to take the U1 of the standard model and puts it into a compact framework. But now if it's compact and electric charge is part of this theory, electric charge is compact. You can't write down arbitrary charges. So that was one of the beautiful reasons for grand unification, that suddenly U1 wire, the standard model, which was non-compact, is now compact. So all electric charges are, com are quantized. In the, but Dirac, 90 years ago, told us that if you have a magnetic monopole, then, elect then electric charge is quantized. That's Dirac. So gut theory says, if I embed U1, the standard model, in a compact group, electric charge is quantized. And remarkably, the two are unified because now it turns out that in the grand unified theory, even though you didn't put a magnetic monopole by hand, it predicts the existence of these particles. The standard model doesn't, but in grand unified theory, you predict the magnetic monopole, which must exist. It's a theorem. So that's so now that now we know that Dirac is right, but in a different way. Dirac didn't know what the structure of the monopole is in grand unified. Dirac said, give me a monopole and I'll show you why electric charge is quantized. When unified theory says, look, I have a very compact theory, so electric charge must be quantized because of mathematics. But there is physics application and monopole exists. So that's, that, that's how Dirac is realized in these theories. And Dirac basically said, if there's a G, if G magnetic monopole exists, then E is quantized in units of 1 over G. E.g. is this. It's not, it's not difficult to see it, and I think it's good for undergraduates to see it. Why? So B, we know that B is equal to curl A, right? B is curl A for electromagnetism. But if A is regular, then the divergence of B is zero. Because if A is regular, right, divergence of a curl vanishes. So therefore, if you want a magnetic monopole with divergence of B not zero, you better do something, right? Something has to happen. And the simplest way is that you can, suppose there's a magnetic monopole and you put a sphere around it. Then what you can do is, in the, no, in the upper hemisphere, you can have a vector potential, a vector potential in the upper hemisphere, which is regular. And then in the lower hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, you can have another vector potential. And so the, in both hemispheres, you have a regular potential. But now in the overlap region, where the, on the equatorial region, right, in the equatorial region, the two uh, things should only differ by a gauge transformation. A, this A upper and o, A lower should give the same physics, right? They overlap. So on the equator, on the equator, they can only differ by a gauge transformation because when you make a gauge transformation, physics shouldn't change. That's the basis of electrodynamics. And so if you work out the difference of the two, it just comes to this. And of course, if you solve this equation, Basically, you deduce that E g over 4 pi z over 2. Mathematically, what's happened is, is if you have an equatorial circle, on each point on the equatorial circle, you are going on a circle, but on each point, you have a gauge transformation, which, which, is, a, which is a U1 compact now. So you're taking a point on the equatorial circle and mapping it into the U1 circle at each point. As you go around, so you're mapping a circle into a circle. It's like saying theta goes to e to the i n theta, right? And so that is how electric charge is quantized, the integer n happens. And n depends on 
how many times you go around the circle. If it's e to the i, 2i theta, then if you go from theta from 0 to pi, you already have done one circle. If you do the whole 2 pi, you get twice and so on. So, so this, is, this is actually the basis of quantization in, in grand unified theories. And in fact, you can write down a solution of a magnetic monopole. So it may, it's predicted, it's not put in by hand. For Dirac, it was some point like particle. He didn't know the mass. He didn't know the properties of it. He said, just give me a monopole. Here, the theory says this is the monopole. It's basically what happens is a monopole in the grand unified theory is a symmetric vacuum where the whole symmetry is available, is restored, surrounded by the broken vacuum. We know that as in this world, the universe, any symmetry, deep, bigger symmetry is broken. We only see electromagnetic weak interactions, different forces, and so on. But inside the monopole, the symmetry is restored. So it's really uh, it's this kind of a structure. Symmetry is restored, and outside, it looks like a magnetic monopole, just Dirac's monopole, far away. And all this structure exists. Of course, now the structure depends on the kind of theory you are working with. And, and you can actually make them in the early universe, the monopole. And this is sometimes called the Higgs cable mechanism. You know, you start with it, it's like a phase transition, a ferromagnet. You cool it down, you produce, you know, spins and iron. Then you start with a very symmetric symmetry at high temperatures, symmetry is restored. And as you drop in the temperature, you start making these magnetic monopoles where these symmetries, which was here, get locked in by the Higgs field, which now tries to take values because it's broken. When the symmetry breaks, it means that the Mexican had potential. The field has to decide where it sits. And it can sit anywhere. Remember, in the, if you have a Mexican hat, it, it, a U1 circle is like it, sit, it can sit here at different points. On the, they all equivalent, and therefore it points. And then what happens mathematically is that you trap a monopole and you produce that. In fact, you produce too many if you do it naively, and you have to do some gymnastics to cut it down, and so on to some observable number. One of the big predictions is if you have a is to test, remember these are very high scale theories, but they're producing heavy objects. You can't make it at CERN in the collider, but you can make it in the early universe. That's the connection to the early universe. That you can make it and dilute it, and you need a large scale detector to look for those things. Gravitational waves are fundamental, have been observed in the last years, and in fact, I think in, in Italy also we have a detector, right? We have a, there's a LIGO, Virgo is, where is Virgo then? Is it a Virgo detector? Yeah, this is the Virgo detector. Where is it again? Do you remember where Virgo is located in Italy? Around Pisa. Uh, yeah, in the ice. Uh, near Pisa, near Pisa, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There's a, in fact, they have put a nice bound on some gravitational waves, like advanced LIGO and Virgo, on how many gravitational waves you can make. I mean, there's a, after gravity, you know, the discovery the last, the last five, six years, these theories at high scale have become important because they predict structures like monopoles and another structure they predict are called strings, where you have strings are like vortices, again, in a superfluid or a superconductor, you know, like a Meissner effect. If you try to put a magnetic field, it goes in a tube because of the Meissner effect. So these are like vortex tubes and uh, or like in a superfluid. And these objects are like string-like objects, so like this string. I don't know if I can touch one of these strings, like this string here, like a string. So basically, if you have a string, you put a circle around it. And all, so a string is basically carrying all the energy. And that's where the symmetry is restored. Because, you know, you know Mexican had potential. The top is where it's a maximum. It's not the where the vacuum is. The vacuum is here. But if you can trap this top, this energy, then that's where the string is. So in the string, basically, the, the symmetry is restored. And as you go around the circle, you basically, uh, and where the vacuum is, so the Higgs field is in the vacuum. So basically, you're taking points on the circle and mapping it into the vacuum. And this map, mathematicians have defined for us. And basically, if this map is non-trivial, then the string is topologically non-trivial. And these are predicted in many theories, actually, extensions of it. So this, the strings are. As the universe is in a given time, let's say this is the horizon, you have strings with cutting loops, closed loops, moving around. And these are gauge strings, and as they move around, they radiate gravitational waves. These are different from the black hole collisions, gravitational waves people have found, those astrophysical things. These are from topological structures, 
And, and his, these strings will continue to radiate at different frequencies. People have managed to estimate the, uh, the spectrum of these things. And with time short, I think I should just... Basically what they found is, if you have the energy density emitted in these primordial gravitational waves from the strings that are formed at each epoch, they, you know, the universe is expanding and the strings are there radiating and they are being redshifted. So you take all, and then they are intersecting and making loops. If you take all these into account, the excitement basically is that they are from the pulsar timing away, there are other experiments. I think there is a uh, light, light, there is the space-based experiments, and there is ground-based experiments, LIGO, VERGO, and others. And this measures the, <clears throat> the string tension, basically the dimension of the string tension. The strings have an energy mass per unit length, and it depends on that string tension how much waves you are living and and these things these objects that you can never produce in the lab because the energy is they're just too massive but notice how these these spectrums can be measured in these experiments in the ongoing uh, in the planned experiments essentially so <clears throat> i think this basically brings me to the end of my talk uh, the idea being that we have these with all the detectors we have now, we can start testing through cosmology and astrophysical measurements structures that are present in these more, more unified theories, which are, cannot be produced at, 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 at the colliders in the foreseeable future, but can be produced, have been produced, if you assume in the early universe can be detected. On the other hand, if we have supersymmetry or some new physics in the TV range, then that can be probed also at the CERN collider. Thank you very much.